chapter 6, as we are continuing through our series through the book of Ephesians this morning, looking at the particular item of the armor of God, the breastplate of righteousness. So turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 6. We are continuing through the book of Ephesians, and particularly we've been going article by article through the armor of God as we finish off this great epistle. And this morning, the title of the sermon is Vital Righteousness. Vital Righteousness. Now, I am just beginning my hobby um, or outdoor activity of becoming a hunter. I'm still very new at it, not particularly good at it. i um, had very little success for the most part in it. Um, but by God's grace, I'm learning. I'm growing, you know, working on the skill. It's something I'm trying to endeavor to do better. And as you learn how to hunt and as you're learning how to take down an animal, particularly I've been focused on deer, there's something that's very important as you look to actually take your shot at that animal. If you can actually get close enough to take a shot, which I've learned is much harder than actually taking the shot, is getting close enough to take the shot or seeing any animal at all can be quite difficult if you're not particularly good at it. But as you get close enough to take the shot at that animal, there's one thing that's very important. You want to shoot at the vitals, right? If you're not shooting an animal just to wound it, to have it to run off, to never be found again, you're not shooting at it just to maim the animal. You're shooting at its vitals in order to put down that animal and it's the most humane way you possibly can. And that is by a clear shot to its vitals. You see, the vitals are incredibly important. As we think of our own body, it's our heart, it's our lungs. It's the thing which our rib cage protects in our body. As we consider the breastplate this morning, the breastplate has one purpose, and that is to protect the vitals, as we will see in our righteousness, we are told in the armor of God, is to be that breastplate. So let us consider this vital righteousness as we look at God's word. We will look at, be looking specifically at the second half of verse 14 in chapter 6. But to set its context, let me go ahead and open by reading verses 13 through 17 of God's word. It says, Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, having done all to stand firm. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the word of the Spirit, which is the word of God. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Would you pray with me? Oh, dear Heavenly Father, I pray that as we open your word, as we consider the truth of your word and the vital truth of righteousness within the Christian life, that we would not take these things lightly as our very spiritual life is at stake if we do not protect it with this one article of the armor. So, Lord, would we take these things seriously and soberly, and we would always consider these things in light of Christ and what he's done for us. Lord, would you help us not to be hearers of the word only, but also doers of the word, full of faith in the promises of God. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, as we begin, I want to remind us of a few things as we are now working through this armor of God section that we have looked at in previous weeks. And the first is that as we consider this armor of God, we must consider the overarching armor of God is that we are clothed in Christ. In fact, this is what the first three chapters of Ephesians really point us forward to is the glory of our gospel hope of what Christ has done for us and saving us from our death and sin and rebellion and purchasing us into the kingdom of the almighty God. And thus, as we consider our clothing, our armor, so to speak, as Christians, the overarching theme of Ephesians is that we must clothe ourselves in Christ. But as we see in the first three chapters of Ephesians, it doesn't end there. After we see that 
the glories of our redemption and our purchasing in Christ, we are then told in the second half of the book of Ephesians, how then shall we live? What is our duty here in the Christian life? And this goes into very specific details, even how we govern our household, how we engage as employees, how we use our tongues, all these things are brought into the light of how we live as Christians. And then to conclude this how then shall we live section, Paul sends us off then into battle by telling us how we are to arm ourselves to fight for the sake of God's kingdom and righteousness here in this world. Now, last week we looked at the first article, putting on the belt or girdling our loins with truth. And we remembered that this truth is not particularly Christ, but is a reference to the truth of doctrine, but on the belt of right belief but also the truth of sincerity, the truth of heart, genuinely believing this. And this week we look at this breastplate of righteousness. Now you may ask, what is righteousness? And why are we spending another whole week talking about half a verse um, as we consider the breastplate of righteousness? Well, the term either righteous or righteousness appears in our Bibles well over 500 different times, and it's used in a number of different ways in those different times. And thus, it's going to take a little bit of work for us to flesh out what it means to arm ourselves with this righteousness in this passage. It's not something as simple as giving just a straightforward definition of what that means for us. There's times where the sermon will be a little technical, but I encourage you to bear with me because getting through that technical side of it leads to the application of it. Now, with that being said, there's a very simple answer for us given in the boys or the catechism for boys and girls, and that is what is righteousness, and that very short and simple answer that is very true in the scripture is it is God's goodness. Righteousness is God's goodness. Thus, we must see, despite all its various uses in the scripture, righteousness is defined not merely by our God. In other words, God isn't the only one that assigns the proper definition to what righteousness is, but righteousness is defined as an attribute of God. Righteousness is God's goodness. It is His goodness. What is righteousness? It is God's, His goodness. So we must not merely consider why we are to arm ourselves with righteousness, but why specifically ought righteousness to be our breastplate in the battle. So we'll consider what is this righteousness that we're called to arm ourselves, and why is this of vital importance? Why is this assigned to being the breastplate as the Spirit gave to us this glorious armor of God? So those things being said, we'll spend our time in three different points this morning. We will consider righteousness purchased, righteousness practiced, and righteousness preserves, all right? Righteousness purchased, righteousness practiced, and righteousness preserves. Let's begin by considering righteousness being purchased. When's the last time someone has gone out to purchase some righteousness at the grocery store? Is that on any of your shopping list this past week? All right, there's maybe some perverse forms of Christianity where they might try to sell you that sort of thing, right? Sow the seed of faith and you might get yourself some more righteousness. I've never heard it particularly in those sort of phrases, but maybe someone's tried to pull that off before. Um, But when we say righteousness purchased, are we talking about the fact that we are called to go out and buy ourselves some righteousness? No, we are certainly not talking about that. As we've been going through our financial um, class during Sunday school, we certainly don't have a category on this is how you go and buy some righteousness. Now, righteousness certainly can come out in the things that you purchase and how you spend your money, but it's not something that you can acquire by purchasing yourself. But that being said, we must realize that all righteousness that any human has is something that was purchased. It was something that was bought, something that was paid for. And this comes from the fact that as man fell into sin, going back to Genesis chapter 3, all men fell from righteousness. It tells us in Romans 3.10 that no one is righteous, no, not one. Every single person has fallen from the state of righteousness in sin. Remember, righteousness, it's God's goodness. It's the perfect standard. It's not sinning in absolutely any way when it's perfectly ascribed. And what did happen when man fell 
from God's command. They fell from that state of righteousness. They failed to meet God's goodness. They failed to keep his law perfectly. Adam right, was righteous prior to the fall, but he did not stay righteous. The same can be said of Eve. They fell from that state of righteousness, and from then all their posterity, all of mankind, has fallen from righteousness. And that is why Paul can say in Romans chapter 3, verse 10, that no one is righteous, no, not one. Because is any of us perfect like God is perfect? No, not a single one of us is and the fall corrupted this righteousness. It made it to where no man just instantaneously, immediately um, acquires it. No one can be right with God without righteousness, though. So this leaves us with a problem. No man is righteous, no, not one. Yet no man can be right with God without having righteousness. God's standard is perfect. The gospel is not that man messed up God's perfect standard of righteousness, and thus God said, okay, I, I feel bad for you, I have pity on you in this fallen state, I'm going to lower the bar so that mankind can get in even though they've not held my standard. Is that the gospel? No, I'm just going to set it up to where you can maybe make some meager, modest efforts, and you're not going to do great, but you're going to give it your best some of the time, well, not even really that, but you're going to put some sort of effort forward and I'll accept you on those basis. Is that the gospel? No, God keeps his standard. And you notice even in the New Testament, as exhortations are given, the standard is always perfection. As we were looking to the standard of marriage, how are husbands called to love their wives? As Christ loved the church, does it, and, and there's no qualifiers. It doesn't say, and I know you're not going to do that perfectly, certainly, you're still fallen, but do the best you can. Is that the way it's written? No. It just says, love your wife. Christ loved the church. God's standard is perfect. And thus, man, when man fell from that, that created a horrible problem. How then is man going to become right with God? Because they can't do it on their own. They're not doing it on their own, but they must become righteous if they are to be saved. Well, this leads us to the glory of the gospel of what Jesus did. That God promised right after the fall that he was going to send from the offspring of woman one who would come and crush the head of the serpent. And then throughout the Old Testament, through types and shadows and promises, we see this promise of this one who would come and who would fulfill all righteousness, the one who would do what the first Adam didn't do, one who would be perfect in every way. And that's exactly what Jesus then came and did. He came and took on flesh. And throughout all his life, from the moment of being a child all the way through his final breaths here on this earth, Jesus, in every way, lived perfectly. He never sinned. He was totally righteous at all times. And we see that it didn't just lead to a perfect life, but even the purpose of his death was for the fact that he was sinless and we were sinners. It says in 1 John 3, 5, you know that he appeared to take away sins and in him there is no sin. Why did Jesus come? Why did he live the perfect life? To take away sins and in him there is no sin. And we see at the baptism of Jesus, it says, why was he doing this? Why was he being baptized? Well, it says that he was being baptized in order to what? to fulfill all righteousness. He was doing the good work that man had failed to do. He was doing the opposite of what Adam had done as the greater and second Adam. And this is exactly what Jesus did. Jesus fulfilled all righteousness in his life. And as he died that substitutionary death on the cross, we tend to only focus on one aspect of that for the Christian. We think of the fact that this perfect God sacrificed himself on the cross for us sinners, and if we place our faith in him, God will forgive us of all our sins. 100% true, praise be to God. That's not the only thing he did on that cross. There's a great exchange that happens for those who would receive him by faith. Not only does he take all of our sin and take it upon himself, but then he gives us as well, in our account, credited to us his own righteousness. Righteousness. 
Thus, when God sees us, it's not merely that our account was wiped clean. When God looks at us, he sees fully the righteousness of his son. And this is referred to as, in in more technical terms, the imputed righteousness of Christ or the imputed righteousness of Jesus. That God takes our sin upon himself as a sacrifice and gives to us, credits to our account, his own righteousness. We see this um, talked about in a few different verses. Listen to what it says in 2 Corinthians 5, 21. It says, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So not only did he take our sins, but so that we might become the righteousness of God. It also says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we might receive mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. The the Lord Jesus takes our sin from us and credits to us righteousness to our account. One more verse to consider this, Romans 5.19 For as by one man's disobedience, speaking of Adam, the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience, speaking of Christ, the many will be made what? Righteous. Through the righteousness of Christ, through his finished work, we are no longer counted as sinners, but as saints, because when God looks at us, it's not that he's seeing all of our perfect actions, that's not the case, but he sees the perfect work of Christ in our account. These are glory, the glorious realities of the imputed righteousness of Christ in the great exchange. And we must see that in light of what Jesus has done, if we are found in Christ, that we are seen by God, he counts us as perfectly righteous. What's glorious about this is that this doesn't just work going forward from the time when Christ died on the cross and rose from the grave but actually works retroactively as well. All the saints of the Old Testament, how were they credited as righteous before God? It's because they were found in the righteousness of Christ. What does it say about our father Abraham or Abram at this time in Genesis 15, 6? It says, and he believed the Lord and he counted it to him as righteousness. Notice, how was he made righteous? Was it because Abram was perfect? No, you don't have to read much of the Genesis account to realize that Abram was not perfect, okay? He had his own problems. But how was it that God looked upon him and counted him as righteous? It's because of his faith. He believed in the Lord, and thus, through his faith in God, God counted, credited to his account, the declaration of righteousness, which is a glorious reality. And we must realize that this imputed righteousness of Christ is something that happens instantaneously, completely, and finally at the moment of our justification. When we are born again, when we are indwelt with the Spirit, when we repent and believe the gospel, we receive, finished, completely, the imputed righteousness of God. It is done at that point. When God looks at you from that time forward, he counts you as righteous, which is a glorious reality. But the imputed righteousness is not the only type of righteousness in the scriptures. There's also the imparted righteousness of Jesus. Imputed righteousness isn't the only category, but there is also for the believer the imparted righteousness of Jesus. Now, Antinomians, those who believe, which antinomian literally means anti-law, try to only emphasize the imputed righteousness of Jesus, thus to say, you are totally righteous in Christ. He's, when God sees you, he sees Christ, and thus obedience doesn't matter, because when God looks at you, he sees Jesus, and he sees the perfection of Jesus, and so it really doesn't matter if you try to follow God's laws or not, because God already sees you in Christ, and obedience then thus doesn't really matter, is the type of logic they will try to give. 
And nothing could be further from the truth. And the reason that is so false is because it confuses the imputed and the imparted righteousness of Jesus. So what is this imparted righteousness of Jesus that's distinct from that imputation, okay? Like I said, there's some technicalities here, all right? Imputed, you're found in Christ. God sees you as righteous. Happens at the moment of justification. Imparted righteousness is that righteousness that God is growing and maturing in you through the process of sanctification. It's the fact that God is conforming you more and more into his image and likeness, which happens from that moment that you're saved and is this ongoing imperfect process for the rest of your life that will be completed when either you die or Christ returns. In glory, then when we, our righteousness will be completed at that point. But the scriptures must teach that we are imparted with the righteousness of Christ, that this is ultimately a work of God, that he is making us new bit by bit from that moment after we are made new declaratively in our salvation. We see that nothing, um, are, and we must see from this, that nothing anyone does can be righteous unless he is made new in Christ first. We see in Romans 14, 23, for whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. So let me ask you, if someone doesn't have saving faith in Christ, can they be doing righteous deeds? No, they can't. Because anything that doesn't proceed from faith, the scripture tells us, is sin. Yet for those of us who have been made new by faith in Christ, who have been born again, as we seek to follow God in faith, can we do righteous deeds according to that? We can not perfectly, but genuinely, we can. It is not as if we can do this perfectly, but we can do this sincerely. It is a gift of Jesus enabling our obedience. Jesus is not merely transforming us and then leaving us alone. He continues to transform us bit by bit in this life. We must remember, often when we talk about salvation or being saved, We think exclusively of our justification, that moment of new birth, that moment when I first confessed the gospel. And that is a critical point in salvation. But salvation is the work from beginning to end. Salvation is that work that God begins and God finishes. The saving work of Christ encompasses our justification, our sanctification, all the way through to our glorification. It's all the process of God's saving work. And thus, that transformation process of sanctification, that's part of God's work as well. It is a work of Jesus. So why go through all this technical stuff and flesh out the distinction between the imputed righteousness of Christ and the imparted righteousness of Christ? What is the purpose of that? Because it's crucial for us to understand what we are being asked to put on when we are called to put on the breastplate of righteousness. We are being asked to put on here the imparted righteousness of Jesus. You realize that in Christ, you are already full and finished and complete with the imputed righteousness of Jesus. You don't have to keep putting that on. That's finished. That's a done work. But through this Christian life, and particularly as you're called into battle, you do have to keep taking efforts to live righteously. Because guess what? That's not intuitive. And we still struggle with sin. And it's still a daily battle to live in a way that's honoring to the Lord. And thus what we're asked to be put on here was to cover our vitals is the holy Christian life, is the breastplate to live according to God's law. It is to live according to his word. This is the righteousness that we are being called to. So we see in the first point that righteousness is ultimately purchased, and that's not just for the imputed, it's also for the imparted. Because guess what? Any sanctification, any righteousness that you have in your Christian life, you don't get to take credit for. It's all to God's glory. He's the one doing the good work. But as we then are seeking to follow him, we need to actually engage in righteousness being practiced. We need to actually put these things into motion. Now, few things are more offensive to people's sensibilities than rules imposed by someone other than themselves. You see, we like to make rules for other people. 
We're to, it's not that we're opposed to rules, okay? If we can make rules for other people to follow and they did them perfectly, we would be fine with that arrangement, right? If you could tell everyone around you how to live and they would follow it perfectly all the time, most of you would probably be okay with that. So we're not opposed to rules. We don't like rules that are imposed upon us by other people. And thus, it's very easy and very popular to slip into this sort of antinomian ditch that says, as Christians, you can just do whatever you want, and God doesn't care. Because guess what? You're in Jesus, and none of it matters anymore, right? That's, that's a doctrine that our sensibilities love, because it lets us do whatever we want to do. But that's not the heart of a Christian. That's not the mind of someone who's been bought by Christ but rather, if we confess with our mouth and believe in our hearts that Jesus is Lord, we're going to actually try to live under his lordship. And that means that we have to actually look to God's book and say, what does he tell us to do? Soldiers, how does it go in battle when the troops stop following the orders of their commanding officers? Is that a good strategy in warfare? When everyone just starts doing whatever they want and no one's taking orders anymore? Of course that doesn't work on the battlefield, right? If people aren't doing what they're supposed to be doing, all chaos will ensue. Well, friends, here, what are we told? We're told that we are soldiers in Christ's army. We must realize that we have been given marching orders. It is not our job to question them. It's not our job. It's, our job to come, it's not our job with, to come up with something better than them. Do you know if God's law says something, you think, I think I... I could do that better. You're wrong, okay? It's not your job. It's not our job to question God's word. It's not our job to be wiser than God's word. It's our job to follow God's word and to follow it faithfully. It is one of the great joys for myself to pastor in a community where people in our church regularly, even multiple times daily, hear the phrase, duty first, okay? Duty first, for all you army families here, right? You hear that over and over and over again. Well, guess what? That's a great thing to internalize because there is a part of you that will want to be governed by whatever the whims of your own emotions or your own feelings or your own desires at any given moment will say. But as Christian soldiers, what would it look like if we adopted that into our Christian practice? Duty first. I know I don't want to share the gospel with my neighbor right now, but duty first, right? That's what I have to do. I don't really want to be generous at this particular moment. I would rather keep that to myself. Duty first. What would it look like if we actually embodied this into every aspect of our Christian living? We are soldiers of Christ. What has he called us to do? I need to be active in doing that. What would it look like if we as Christians adopted the mentality of duty first, not to some general who probably doesn't know what he's talking about, not to some commanding officer who's on a power trip, not to some cruel leader, but to the Lord of lords, the King of kings, and the commander of the great host of the angels in heaven's armies. I think what he's called you to do is trustworthy, and if you don't agree with the order, there's something wrong with you, not him. And it's worth putting ourselves under those orders, even when it's uncomfortable. So how do we practice this righteousness? How do we legitimately fall under these orders and put on this breastplate? Well, to begin, you must be born again. You cannot do any of the imparted righteousness of Jesus. You cannot practice righteousness whatsoever unless you're first found in Christ. Remember, what's not done in faith is sin. So if you think you can live righteously in this life without Jesus, you are 100% mistaken. It will not happen. You can go through all the motions, but if faith is not what's fueling it, it will be in vain. It will be folly and it will be futile. It will not work out. So if you do not know Christ far before you try to figure out what his, all his rules are, you need to submit to him as the one giving the rules first. If he's not your Lord, it doesn't really matter if you dot all the rules correctly anyways. Is Christ your Lord? Have you submitted to him as king of the earth? Have you come under him? Have you confessed that you are a sinner and repented and turned from your sin and trusted in Christ? We will never practice righteousness unless we are found first in Christ. 
The second aspect of practicing righteousness, and this is super complex and complicated, okay? You ready for this? Obey what you know. Obey what you know. Sometimes we get so caught up in studying our Bibles and finding all these new things, and we're not putting any of it into practice. Doing endless Bible studies to which you never apply any of them will do you no good. And I will take any day of the week a Christian who knows a little bit of his Bible and lives like that little bit he knows than the guy whose head is filled up with knowledge and he won't apply any of it. In fact, all it's done is puff him up. What do you know God's word says to do that you're not doing? Start there. Well, I know I need to be a little kinder. Well, work on that then. Well, I know I need to stop raising my voice. Start there. Well, I have this bad habit of lying. Work on your lying. You want to practice righteousness? What is something that you know God's word tells you to do that you're not doing? Apply that. I say, well, that's not very sophisticated. That doesn't have this eloquent point to it. But guess what? I guarantee you, if I were to ask every single one here, what's something that you know the Bible says you should do that you're regularly not doing, every single person here could give me an answer, even if this is the first time you've heard the Bible in years. Do you genuinely not have any aspect of the Bible that you know you ought to do that you're not doing? Of course you do. So obey what you know. You already know plenty of the Bible. And let me give you an incredible command here as Jesus summarized all the commandments of the Old Testament into a very simple framework. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. Let me ask you, who in here is loving God perfectly? Well, guess what? If you're not, you got some work to do in practicing righteousness. Who here is loving your neighbor perfectly? And guess what? Your neighbor can actually just be flesh and blood people around you. Like who, who are actually your neighbors on your street? Who do you cross in the grocery store? That's your neighbor, okay? Are you loving that person? This, this is what it means to practice righteousness. It's not complicated. It's just really hard. And we, we want people to massage it and to tell us all these creative ways to do it. But the reality is it's a matter of doing what God's word has called us to do because we are trusting that he is in control and not us. So the first aspect of practicing righteousness, you have to be born again. The second pra- aspect of practicing righteousness is obey what you already know. And the third aspect of it is learn more and then obey more. Okay. Learn more and then obey more. Let me ask you, as you come to Sunday after Sunday, as you read your Bible day after day, as you're going through all of these things, are you reading it for the purpose of being transformed by it? Are you reading it just to check a box? We can get caught up in this in reading plans, and I, I'm certainly guilty of this myself, where we're just going through it because I have to read these verses today, and that's what I got to do. And, and we just lose completely in there that the Bible is actually supposed to be transforming us as we go along it. If you're never reading the scriptures, if you're never walking away from a sermon or leaving some sort of small group and saying, I need to do this differently and I need to start now, then you're not having the right approach to God's word. You're just being puffed up with more and more knowledge that will do you no good when it comes to your spiritual vitality. What is it that you need to learn more and then apply more? Guess what, friends? You're never going to completely understand every aspect of what this book calls you to. There's more for us to learn and more for us to grasp from it than we are going to grasp in any short amount of time. The question is, what direction are you marching Are you marching towards greater and greater righteousness? Are you standing still? Are you rolling down the hill? Are you moving towards more righteousness or not? Another question worth considering is what about the instruction you've just received recently? Even in Ephesians, we spent a lot of time talking about the family, right? Have all of our families perfectly figured that out since we've spent a few weeks preaching on it? Is that the way it works? 
The pastor preaches a few weeks on the family, and ultimately all the families in the church are perfectly righteous because of it. No, right? It's a daily struggle, something that we commit to over and over again, right? Something that we continue to work at. What is it that you already know in the Scripture, and what should you continue to learn and put into practice? The final point of how we are to apply or practice this righteousness is that we must repent often. We must repent often. Because guess what? As you try to set your feet to the path of what God's word and God's law has called you to do, do you know it's going to become a glaring realization over and over and over again that you're not doing it perfectly, that you're not living perfectly, that you haven't gotten it all figured out yet? And guess what? There's a couple of different ways you can respond to that. One is you can try to minimize your sin and say, well, it's not really that big of a deal. It's not, it's not as bad as I would like to think it is. Another way you can do it is just ignore it completely. And one of the worst things you can do is spiritualize it and say, well, I'm in Jesus, right? He sees me as righteous, so what's the big deal? But instead, we have this wonderful option that we see, and we saw this in the psalm that we read, that as we cry out to this Lord, as we confess to Him all our need, as we bring to Him our inadequacies, as we share with Him our sins, we know that His throne is one of mercy and grace, that He is faithful to forgive us of all unrighteousness. We as Christians should be ones that repent all the time, over and over and over again. Why? Because there's free forgiveness being dished out. There's no reason to withhold repentance. None. Why would you bear a burden when Christ will take it off your shoulders? We should be quick to run to Christ in repentance. And as your needs are exposed, you don't need to wallow about in shame and guilt forever. You see a sin, you bring it to his throne of mercy and grace, and you march forward doing what God has called you to do. I lost my temper. I'm sorry, Lord, help me to correct it. And go forward and start speaking more kindly and control your tongue. It's that simple. We don't have to beat ourselves up and lash ourselves and flog ourselves every time we sin. We don't have to hide those sins from God. He sees them no matter where you hide. Confess them, repent, and move forward, doing what God has called you to do. Guess what? You, the imputed righteousness of Christ is on you. He already sees you declared as righteous, so don't beat yourself up when you sin. Repent and turn from it and start doing what he's called you to do. Don't let it be a burden over your head. Bring it to his throne of mercy and grace. You need to repent often, but also you get to repent often. God gladly takes your burdens from you. Don't carry them yourself. It's a glorious gift that he's given you. But brothers and sisters, we must be fiercely committed to righteous living. Along the way, we will get called legalist when we do this. We will get those that try to decry us as not truly holding the gospel because all you preach is rules and all you guys talk about is laws. That sort of thing will be said if you try to live righteously. And to which you smile and you remind them, I'm saved by grace alone, not a result of works, but because I am in Christ, he has a good work for me to do, and I'm doing my best to walk in that. That's the simplicity of the gospel. It's not what merits your salvation, but it is a fruit of it. So we should seek to set our path to the righteousness that God has called us to do. We should realize that righteousness is purchased. We must realize that righteousness must be practiced. But this leads to our third point, that righteousness preserves. It is vital that we live righteously. Of all the articles of clothing that the Spirit could have assigned to this idea of righteous living, He assigns it particularly to the breastplate. And we must remind ourselves that the breastplate is an instrument with a singular purpose. You know, you think as you go into battle, there's some like multi-use items, okay? Things that can be used in a number of different ways. The breastplate has one purpose and one alone. It's to protect your vitals. That's why it exists. 
And if any of the soldiers in here have have ever had to wear body armor for any period of time, they can tell you that it's not particularly comfortable, okay? And righteous living, guess what? At times, it's not particularly comfortable. If you want comfort, there's an easier path, all right? God never said, follow me, it will be totally comfortable. Is that something Jesus ever proclaimed to his followers? No. No. I can tell you, wearing the breastplate of righteousness, it will not always be comfortable. You're wearing body armor in the Middle East before you can surely attest to the fact that it's not very comfortable. But the comfort of taking it off in battle is not worth the consequence of being without it. And that's why the soldier wears it. If you are on the battlefield and the bullets are flying, would you rather have an uncomfortable piece of armor around your chest or would you rather be wearing it, right? It is uncomfortable at times, but the value far outweighs the cost. As Christians, we must realize that we have life in Christ. Our salvation is referred to as this sort of life in a number of different illustrations within the Scriptures. It's referred to as what? A new birth, right? It's life. What does Jesus do? He takes away our heart of stone and gives us what? A heart of flesh. It's spiritual life. Our spirituality, our life in Christ has vitals. It has the new heart that's been given to us by Christ Jesus. And these vitals must be protected. Your spiritual life must be protected. There's a lot of dangers that will happen as you walk into battle, and it doesn't matter as much if your foot is protected, if you lose your heart, right? The core aspect of protecting yourself must be with your vitals, and we're told here that spiritually, the breastplate is assigned to righteousness. So our vital spiritual health, we are told, is connected to this aspect of righteousness. Now, this isn't the only time that this breastplate is used in Scripture to describe other things. So we, you could overemphasize this point and say righteousness is the only thing that protects you spiritually, and that's not the case, because listen to what it says in 1 Thessalonians 5, um, verse 8. It says, But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. Okay, so there in 1 Thessalonians, this breastplate is re- referred to as faith and love. So are those vital to the Christian's spiritual health as well? Yes, okay, you don't want to read these things in such a narrow way as to make it exclusive. But a vital aspect of our spiritual health is also not merely faith and love, but also our righteous living, as we see here in Ephesians. I want us to consider a few ways in which our righteousness, our righteous living that we have, acts as a preservative for the Christian. First, it preserves our assurance of salvation. I can tell you as a pastor that by far the most common reason why people are in my office telling me that they are doubting their faith in Christ is because they have a sin that they are not repentant of, or ongoing lifestyles of unrepentance, and thus they're struggling with their own assurance of salvation. If you want comfort or peace, one of the great ways that that's accomplished is by living according to God's law, by living according to his standards. Now, if you have ever struggled with assurance, please don't hear me say that that's exclusively the cause of it. It is not. There's different things that can cause a doubt of assurance of salvation. But often one of the major causes is due to a lack of righteous living. Their lifestyle is not in accordance to what God says, and thus they go, is this even real? Is this even real for me? And far too often as people abandon the faith, they will say, well, I just lost my faith in God. I don't believe in that stuff anymore. But what it really boils down to is, I knew God told me I shouldn't do this one thing, but I wanted to do it more. And so I'm going to say I've lost my faith in God. But really, it's because I want to do this sin that I know God says not to do. And so rather than being honest about that and saying, I would rather rebel against the living God, it's far easier intellectually, emotionally to just say, well, I just don't really believe in God anymore. 
right? It's easier for us to wrap our brain around that than to say, I know what God says, I know what his standard is, and I'm choosing to do otherwise. That's a pill a lot of people don't want to swallow emotionally, but it's exactly what they're doing. We must realize that righteousness preserves our assurance. It also preserves our zeal. We will not be focused on fighting the enemy on the battlefield when we are being personally overtaken by the enemy in our own life. When your life is a train wreck of not following what God has told you to do, don't expect to be particularly useful on the battlefield. When you're not even preserving your own living, you can't even get your own household in order, so to speak, you're going to have a really tough time on the battlefield waging war. One of the things I've seen often, maybe you've seen this as well, and how this righteousness connects with preserving our zeal. Have you ever come to a new conviction in the scriptures and then look around, maybe at, particularly as it pertains to righteousness, hey, God's words tell us to do this. No one's doing this. You come to this conviction and you have this initial zeal for that truth. And then you look around and you go, why isn't anyone else doing this? And you haven't been doing it for years either. But you just come to this conviction in God's word, you see it, you see that, hey, God's word teaches this and no one's doing it. And now all of a sudden, what do you have a passion for? You have a passion for other people doing it as well, right? As you get your own life in order, then automatically you start caring about what other people are doing as well. Now, in this, I need to offer a caution here. Sometimes in our zeal and our excitement, we can really be ungracious to other people and have this idea of instantaneous revolutionary sanctification where now that I've come to the conviction, everyone needs to instantly have the same conviction as me, even though God took years to teach you that truth and show them to you. And you cannot always be that charitable and how God is going to bring up other people in that truth over time as well, all right? So there's an immature sort of zeal that can come with this new conviction. But there's also, I think, a genuine godly sort of aspect of this that as we take logs out of our own eye, we're able to see more clearly and we want to help other people more clearly, right? As we are learning God's truth and we're seeing the benefits of applying those truth, we want to say, as Paul did, follow me as I follow Christ, right? There's a better way here that we want to follow. And I think we have to be aware of our own immaturity sometimes as it pertains to zeal, but also it is a great benefit that our zeal can come and be produced by righteous living in a mature way as well. So righteousness preserves our zeal, but it also preserves our fruitfulness. Righteous living does bear good fruit. You will reap what you sow. As a general truth in this life, following God's law in God's world leads to blessing. Ignoring the orders of the creator of heaven and earth and expecting things to just go marvelously in this earth is not typically how it goes as a general rule or principle. Now, as I say that, there's instantly the desire to you know, insert the, the footnote and say, but what about this? Or, but what about this? Yes, there are exceptions to that. But generally speaking, as you order yourself in God's world according the way he designed it to function, you shouldn't be surprised when things generally go better for you. And as you rage war against the Lord of heaven and earth, you shouldn't be surprised when things tend to go poorly, all right? Righteous living does bear good fruit, and thus we must realize that righteousness, although uncomfortable at times, is going to yield a peaceful fruit of righteousness for those who are trained by it. All right, no discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful, we learn in Hebrews. But it does yield that peaceful fruit of righteousness for those who are trained by it. The training's uncomfortable, friends. This breastplate is heavy. But do you want that fruit of righteousness? Don't look to your own opinions. Look to God's law. He set out a standard for how we should live. The final aspect of how righteousness preserves is it preserves our effectiveness. We cannot expect to win the war when we are ignoring orders. We cannot expect to win victories for the kingdom when we're ignoring the orders of our commander. It doesn't work that way. Simply put, the most dangerous men in Christ's army are those who put to practice that which they learn in the scriptures. <laughs> 
You want to be really effective for the kingdom? Even if you don't know your Bible very well, take what you know and put it into practice. Start doing it. You'd be amazed what God can do through faithful actions offered up by his people. What has he called you to do? Go about doing it. We must see that practical righteousness, another way of saying this is just Christian living, is our preservative. It is our breastplate in the battle. So in conclusion, we must realize that this is all of Christ. Both our standing before God and our growth and sanctification is ultimately a work of the finished son. It's not something you can do on your own, but by the spirit which indwells in you as a gift of God. And thus, it should always be something that brings glory to God. If you do any act of what you think is righteousness and puff out your chest afterwards, guess what? It wasn't all that righteous because you're doing it for your own glory and your own fame and whatever's not done in faith is sin. Are you building your kingdom or God's? It must be done for Christ and through Christ and for his glory. This must all be for Christ. And thus, this all must flow from faith. This is not faith that's fueling these acts of obedience. It will be worthless. But when done in faith to the God of heaven and earth, who's redeemed you and purchased you and bought you, God can do glorious things through them. We must remember that Christ has counted you as righteous. That is a finished work. That Christ has enabled you to live righteously. That is an ongoing work. And that Christ will glorify your righteousness upon your death or at his return, which is a great hope to look forward to. In the meantime, full of the Spirit, empowered by love, duty first, Christian soldiers, God has a good work for you to do. Would you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that your Spirit would enable us to march into battle, covering the vitality of our spiritual life with good works. Lord, we know that those offerings are imperfect in this life, and we praise you that you are gracious enough to forgive us in all the ways we fail. But Lord, in knowing that we will fail, would we not then grow cold to putting forth the work of seeking to do that which you've called us to do? And would you do it all for your glory? It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.